Okay, Labor Day, let's get started, please. Okay, so announcement number one. The, uh, I had to move the date of test two. So uh, I did not, so when I set the dates, I just copy these over from CISC 124. Uh, so the times were wrong to begin with because they're the times for CISC 124. Also, there was a, the date for test two was set the same day as for 124. Uh, and this course is actually a co-requisite with 124. Uh, so that means there were people in 124 who would have to write the te two tests in a day, so I moved it. So the correct dates, I believe, November 14th, which is a Monday, uh, and the correct time is 2.30, not uh, 12.30, which is what I had. So thank you for those people who pointed that out to me. Uh, those are now fixed. All right, there's uh, no deck of lecture slides today. I'm going to lecture straight from the course notes and I'm gonna use the terminal. Um, I'm gonna flip between the course notes and the terminal today. All right, uh, so commands in bash can be one of four different things. So you can have the built-in shell commands, right? So to get the built-in shell commands, if you, that's not right, sorry. To get the built-in, what's going on? All right, uh, alt, okay, alt, whoa. Oh. oh, come on, sorry, just a second here. That's better. Come on. Wrong one. Okay, so to get the built-in shell commands at the prompt, you can always type in help. And uh, if you're in bash, this will print out basically every command that the, bash set, uh, that the bash shell natively knows about. Right, and you can see there's all, quite a few commands. There's not, actually there's not that many, but there's quite a few commands and we're not gonna cover even a, even a quarter of these, right? Um, you can see some of the commands that we've been using though, right? So cd is here, right? Uh, pwd is here. Um, I think those are the only two, oh no, echo's here. If you've seen echo, echo is the one that prints, right? Uh, so those are the built-in commands. Now, a lot of the commands that you use are not built-ins. They're actually executable programs, right? So that is, it's some sort of program that could be written in a different language, um, or it could be a script written in the bash language, or Perl, or Python, or whatever other scripting language you wanna choose, right? So it could be a compiled program like C, or Java, or something else. So programs like ls and cal and date, those are all compiled programs um, that also act as commands. All right, there are these things called aliases. So an alias is a keyboard shortcut or an abbreviation. So you can actually define these things in your shell if you wanted to. Um, some of the commands uh, on uh, your shell already knows about, so if you're using the virtual machine, you already have a bunch of aliases defined, uh, probably. So there's a command called ll, uh, which is just a version of ls. Uh, ll is uh, short for ls minus al. Um, so that's actually what's called an alias, right? So it's just a command that's, it's just a shortcut for another command. And then you can have these things called shell functions, which we're gonna see in probably three or four weeks. Right, so you can write a function in bash, that function then effectively becomes a command, um, which is odd, but that's the way it works in bash. Okay, now if you wanna know uh, what type of command uh, your command, what is the type of the command that you're using, there is a command called type that will tell you what type of command is cd. Right, so if you run this shell, uh, sorry, if you run that command, it tells you cd is a shell built in. Right, and of course you can always type this into your shell directly. There we go, right, so if I do uh, whoop, type cd, right, it spits out cd is a shell built in, right? So it's telling you it's a built in command. Now the reason you wanna know that it's a built in is because you need, if you ever need to look up help for the cd command, you need to know how to do it. And the way you look up help for a built in as opposed to a regular command is different. Uh, otherwise, there's no real difference between what, uh, if a command is a built-in or not, right? So type ls, if you run that, it'll tell you that, L oh, so on my computer, ls is actually aliased, right? So ls is in fact an alias, right? And it says it's alias to ls minus minus color equals auto, 
right? And that's why uh, in my shell, where am I? All right, in my shell, if I type in ls, I get colors, right? So it prints out the directory name uh, in the color blue, right? Let me go to a slightly more interesting directory, right? Uh, oh, sorry, let me go to a slightly more interesting directory, right? And now you can see that uh, any names in white, those are just names of regular files. Any names in blue are names of directories. Uh, I don't have any, oh wait, in scripts I do. So let's go into scripts and then, I don't know, introduction. Right here you can see everything's in green. Uh, so anything shown in green on my shell happens to be an executable program. So these are all uh, commands that are executable type, right? Okay. And then type of cal, if you run this, this should tell you that it's a, uh, where, where the actual cal executable is, right? So it's telling you cal is an executable program in the directory root, user bin uh, cal. All right, if you need to know uh, where a command is actually defined, or so what file corresponds to the program that corresponds to a command, right? You can use the command called which, right? So which cd, is not gonna print out anything, and it doesn't, right? CD is a built-in command, so there is no program that corresponds to CD. Uh, LS says that LS is the, actually the command slash uh, root user bin LS, right? And which cal says that uh, the cal program is actually the program, is the, corresponds to the file slash user bin cal. Right, so uh, type, and which, uh, a couple of simple commands that tell you uh, some information about a uh, command that you might be interested in. All right, now when you use a command in MASH, uh, the, uh, all commands have, well not all commands, most <coughs> standard commands have the same structure, right? So it's the name of the command, right? Followed by one or more options, right? So the hyphen indicates that you're uh, using an option followed by uh, zero or more arguments. Sorry, that's zero or more options, zero or more arguments. So the arguments are the inputs to the command. Command is just the file name of a program corresponding to a command. It might be the name of a built-in, right? So not necessarily a file name. Uh, hyphen options, those are the optional flags. They modify the behavior of a command. Right? And arguments are the, um, Possibly optional, so some commands are optional, some they're not, right? Uh, it's a list of space separated items on which the command acts, right? So basically you pass it in a bunch of strings and where the strings are separated by spaces. All right, so we've used ls to list the contents of a directory, right? But more generally, ls lists information about files, right? So for example, I can ask ls, to list information about itself, right? So if I switch into the directory root user bin, right? I know that there's a, a file called ls up there. I know that because which told me there was, right? So when I ran which ls, it said, hey, the program ls is actually the file user bin ls, right? So if I ask ls about itself, it's not gonna print out anything interesting. It's just gonna say, well, there's a program called ls. So in this example here, the command is ls. The arguments to the command is also the string ls. Right. Okay, with no options, ls simply prints the name of the file. So that's not terribly interesting. As soon as I start to use options, ls will change the way it behaves, right? So it'll change the output that it generates. So minus s tells you how much uh, disk space the file ls occupies. Right, so again, command name. Right, option, argument. So here I'm asking uh, ls to tell me how much space does the program ls take up, take up on my disk. Right, you run that, it says it print takes out 136 units. Right, uh, now the units are in what are called blocks. Um, which isn't useful to you unless you happen to know what the block size of your hard disk is, and you probably don't. You can figure, you can find out. You probably don't know what it is. I certainly don't know what it is, right? So the option H uh, is short for human readable. So that will print out the size in human readable units. 
let's try what happens there. So that says 136K. So it's actually trying to say that the program LS takes up 136,000 bytes on my disk, right? Or 136 kilobytes. Okay, so the other way to write this, right? You can write it as LS minus S minus H, oh, sorry, minus H LS, right? So you can specify as many options as you want. Um, uh, you can specify them separately if you like, right? So if I run this, it's gonna print the same thing twice, right? For many commands, the options can go after the arguments, but not all of them. So minus LS, minus H. So you could also, oh, sorry. You can also run that and that also works. Yeah, question at the back. Why am I putting, oh, so let me explain that again. Man, this is the most annoying lecture hall on campus. All right, so the general form for any command, well, for any standard command, right? Name of the command, so that's ls in this case, right? Options, if there are any, and then the arguments to the command, right? So in this example here, I want to print out information about the ls program itself. The way I'm gonna do that is I'm going to use the ls command, right? So my command is ls, right? There's my command, here are my options, this is the file that I want some information about, right? I, it doesn't have to be ls. If I wanted uh, information on a different file, uh, ls. So I happen to know that there's a file called cal that corresponds to the calendar program. I can ask for information on that one, right? And uh, that one says it's zero, which is interesting, right? Uh, we'll ignore that for now, right? It's not, it's not wrong. Uh, the, the output's correct, but for now we'll ignore why it prints out zero. Okay, now, the short form options are the, op uh, sorry, the single letter options, right? Any of the options I've shown you so far are always a single letter. Uh, they can be also a single number. Uh, they all begin with a single hyphen, okay? Some commands have what are called long form options, which are basically uh, big words, or words, right? Uh, the long form option makes it more readable, right? So when you read the long form option, it's kind of obvious what the option does. Right? But it takes forever to type in, right? So if you're working at the command line, no one ever uses the long form options. If you're writing a script, right, where you're gonna save the script and then maybe refer to it days, weeks, months, years from now, right, then you might consider using the long form options so you don't have to go up and look up what the short form ones mean, right? So for LS, there are a bunch of options. So here's one, almost all, so hyphen, hyphen. So the long form options start with two hyphens. So almost all is one, that will list uh, almost all of the files in the directory, including the hidden ones. So I'm gonna show you what a hidden file is shortly. Right? Minus minus human readable, that's uh, the same thing as minus H. Right? Minus minus size is the same as minus S. And minus one means print out one column of output. Right? So one line per file. Okay, so let's see what happens when I do run this command. And there we go, right? So it's gonna live CD, change to my home directory, right? So that's gonna switch to slash home sys220 on this, on this virtual machine, right? Almost all means it's gonna list everything in the directory. So notice that it lists these files, um, dot, dot bash aliases, dot bash history, dot bash logout, dot bash rc, dot cache. So in uh, Unix, any file name that starts with a period is considered to be a hidden file, right? Normally these are configuration files. So other programs uh, use these files or directories to store or read information, right? Not surprisingly, dot bash aliases, dot bash history, dot bash logout. These are files that the bash shell uses to store information, right? Uh, if you just write ls, Okay, so CD, control clear my screen. All right, so now I'm in the same directory that I was in the Jupyter Notebook. So if I just write ls, you don't get any of the hidden files, right? Uh, so ls on its own, uh, by default, will not show you any hidden files in the directory. If you want the hidden files, you have to use minus little a, 
and now it spits out a whole bunch of stuff, right? Or you have to use big A, which spits out almost the same thing, except it doesn't print out these two files here, right? So minus A always prints out the directories dot and dot dot, right? So remember what dot is, right? Dot is the current directory. Dot dot is the parent directory. So in your file system, there's actually an entry called dot and an entry called dot dot in every directory. Right? Um, so when you use minus a, little case a, it'll actually print out those two files. Right? Uh, if you use minus big A, it does not print out the files dot and dot dot. Right? So normally if you want to process every file in your directory, including the hidden ones, you don't process the current directory or the parent directory. Right? So that's when you use minus big A. Minus big A corresponds to minus minus almost all. Uh, what else here? Uh, that's minus one, not minus L. Uh, so actually, what is that? Is that a one or, an, sorry. That is a one, yeah. So one is one column of output. Okay, uh, so the ls command has a whole bunch of options, right, uh, that you can find about if you uh, read its man page. Um, some of the more commonly ones that are, some of the more common ones are here including their long options if they exist, right? So minus little a is the same as uh, minus all, right? Lists all the files, including the hidden files, right? Capital A is almost all, same as minus a, don't list dot or dot dot, and so on and so on and so forth, right? So there's a bunch of them here. Uh, minus L is quite useful, so we'll see that in a few days. Um, what else is useful here? Do, do, do. Minus one is useful, minus a, the pair of a's are useful. Uh, and the L, sorry, that's the L, minus L is useful. So I'll show you that in a, in a, I don't know if it's today or in another lecture. All right, carrying on. Now, uh, where do you find out about these options, right? So for beginners, it's frankly, it's probably easier to search, right? Uh, do an internet search and find the information there. Because when you do an internet search, often you'll find the information that you're looking for plus examples. Um, once you become uh, more fluent in uh, using the shell, right? Then you'll start to remember what the options do. Uh, and then occasionally you'll need a reminder. So when you need a reminder, that's when asking for help, for example, becomes a little more useful, right? So the ls command actually has an option called min uh, help, minus, min minus minus help, right? Which will actually display information for it. Not all commands have this option. Some of them do, right? ls happens to be one of them. So if we go to a, if we, there we go, right? So if I do ls minus minus help, right? Uh, it spits out a bunch of information, right? Notice there's quite a lot. Do, 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 quite a lot, all right. Uh, and also notice that it's very uh, succinct, right? It doesn't give you examples, it just tells you what everything does, right? But it does list out all of the options, right? It explains with one line, in this case, right, what that option does, right? No examples here whatsoever, right? And then there's some documentation here, right? This is basically the standard documentation. Well, this is one form of the standard documentation that you'll get uh, when asking for help in the command from the shell directory. Okay, now, if you have a built-in command, um, they may or may not respond to minus minus help. Instead, it's the opposite way around. You write help and then the built-in. So if you write help cd, right, cd is a built-in command. It gives you the same information, right? Again, no examples, right? The description is pretty brief, right? It's complete, but it's brief, right? Uh, and so here are all the options and so on and so on and so forth, right? Uh, now, uh, commands that are not built in, so things like ls, uh, often have what's called a man page, right? So a man page is short for manual page, right? Uh, again, the uh, documentation that's in a man page is not a tutorial, it's a reference, right? Uh, so if the other way to get help on a command is to try man followed by the command, right? So man is itself a command, right? The argument to the command is the command that you're looking for help on, 
I'm not going to run it in the notebook because uh, it's not going to behave properly. I'm going to run it from the terminal directly. Come on. There we go. All right, so man ls. So when you uh, type man ls, you end up with this. Right? Uh, depending on your exact operating system, what you see at the bottom here may or may look a little different. Okay, so this is a man page, right, uh, for the command ls, right? ls lists the directory contents, right? The synopsis tells you uh, how is it that you're supposed to use the, the command. When you look at the synopsis, anything in square brackets, like that, or that, right, is optional. Right? So if it's in a square bracket, it doesn't have to be part of the command. Anything with dot, dot, dot means it will take uh, zero or more. Right? So this is saying ls has some options that you might want to use, right? and it can take in an arbitrary number of them. Right? Furthermore, you can give me some file names an arbitrary number of them, but you don't have to. Right? Square brackets, optional, dot, 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 as many as, uh, arbitrary number. Right? Uh, and then, if you try to scroll or something, oh, actually scrolling does work on here. Okay, it didn't used to work. All right, and now you've got uh, this page of text, and you'll see down here that there's this little prompt. So what actually happened here is that the output of the man page has been sent to another program. So when you type in man blah, the output from the man page goes to a program called less. Uh, and less is a program that is meant to help you view pages of text. Right? So if I press the spacebar, it's going to jump forward one page of text. If I press the backspace, uh, the B, it goes backwards a page of text. Right? So this lets you quickly scroll through a large text file, which is what a man page is. A man page is just a huge text file. Right. If I hit the space button a few times, you're going to see there's a lot of, right, man, the, this command has a lot of options, right? Nobody remembers all the options, right? Uh, anybody who uses uh, the command line, uh, basically for, for frequently used commands, they remember the frequently reused options, right? If you need to find out something more, that's when you have to refer to the man page, right? Or again, search, on that, search online. Okay, so to get out of the man page, it's the letter Q to quit, right? Um, let's look at that one more time. Okay, now navigating the man pages is not easy, especially for new uh, people who haven't done it before. If you press the H button, it will actually show you some help on how to use man, right? So this is help for the uh, less program, actually, right? So summary of the less commands. So if you press H when you're using less, you get the help. Right? If you press Q, that exits. Notice a bunch of other things will also exit. Right? If you want to move forward one line, you can press E or com Control E. Right? The caret is Control. Right? CR is carriage return or just return. Right? And there's a whole bunch of other things here too. I don't remember any of this. I just remember that space and B go forward and backwards. Right? And that's true in the help page as well. Right? So this less program is actually very powerful. It will let you do all sorts of crazy things. Okay, so I told you all of this. All right, so CalSA is a program that we looked at um, in uh, the first and second class, right? Remember, so it's the, uh, you give CalSA a string and then it prints out the string using a cal, right? CalSA has a man page, right, which you can ask for, right? And so um, when it prints it out, it says, uh, it, gives you a, uh, it gives you the name of the program. Uh, notice that you can also use calsync instead of calsay. Uh, and cal it's not recognizing the uh, the monitor. I think the problem. No? Sorry, hang on. Is it back now? All right. 
But I think the only reason it came back is because I switched the window for a second. All right, here we go. It's gone again. I wonder if it's this thing here that's causing it problems. Hmm. Okay. Synopsis, right? So there's the name of the program. Notice it's got lots of things, uh, lots of options, right? So when you look at the CalSA program, it's actually telling you, right, you can change the way the eyes look. You can change the animal that's used to print the cow, right? You can change the way the tongue looks and a bunch of other stuff here, right? Hopefully it lets me scroll past this, okay. All right, now commands on your computer, they're just files, right? There is no requirement uh, that files have different names, right? If you have two files in the same directory, they have to have different names, right? But two files in different directories can have the exact same name. And so what does that mean? Well, commands are just files, right? So you can have two commands that have the same name uh, and that becomes a problem, right? So if you type in man something, right? Man some command and then you get something that you're not expecting, Right, so what's happened is you've asked for help on a command that happens to have the same name as something else that man knows about. Right? And so the way the man pages work is that they're broken up into what are called uh, sections. Right, section one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Right, these are roughly what each section corresponds to. Right, so if you ever type in man blah and you get the wrong man page, you have to specify the section that you're looking for. Right. Normally you're looking in section one for the general command. Right. Okay, so for example, if I type man man, right, uh, then I get, oh, I got one. That's not what I was expecting. Uh, was that what I was, hang on, sorry. Come on. Do, do. All right. Oh. Okay. Man, man. Right. So I get the man page for the man command. Right. Uh, do, do. That's interesting. Uh, that's not what I was expecting. There's a second man uh, entry that man happens to know about in section seven. Uh, oh. Sorry, I got this backwards. Okay, never mind. Uh, so there's actually two different man commands that the man page is aware of, right? The one in section seven is not the one you want, right? So if it pops up this one, then you have to say which is the one you want, right? So the one you want is actually in section one on this operating system, it looks like. Right? Uh, so if you ever get a, if you ever use man and you get something strange, right? Like the documentation for a C function, for example, uh, then you have to go back and put in the correct section name for the command that you're looking for. Uh, most of the time, this is not an issue. Uh, but if you ever, if that ever does happen to you, you have to find the right section that the command is living in, uh, that the man page is, uh, lives in. Okay, so when farting around on your command line, uh, you'll often be doing stuff and then you'll realize, hey, there's this command that I typed in a while ago that I really need back, but I don't remember exactly what it was, right? Or there's this command that I wanna repeat and I just did that a couple of commands ago, can I get that command back? Uh, and the answer is probably yes, uh, from at least, uh, at least for most standard installations of Bash, right? Uh, so most standard installations of Bash will remember the history of commands, right? Uh, which you can look at with this command called history, right? So let me just uh, go to the terminal and type that in. Okay, so I type in the history command, Bash will output all of the commands that have ever been typed into, well, not ever, all of the commands that it remembers that I've typed into the command prompt. Right, or in this case, run from the Jupyter Notebook, right? So you can see here that the last command that I typed in was history, sorry. The command before that was man one man, the command before that was man seven man, and so on and so on and so forth, right? The history is very useful if you're doing a lot of work on the command line. Right? If I want to repeat, well, let me take a look at what's going on here. Okay, the number before the command I've been doing Okay, if I want to repeat a command, right, you can use the history command to repeat a command. So for example, suppose I wanted to repeat that command right there, right, ls minus little a. I could type it in if I wanted to, 
I can type in history and then the 2034. So the uh, number, this is just the line number in the history file, right? So the line number of the command that I want and it will rerun that, to, it's supposed to rerun that command. It did not rerun that command, sorry, hang on. Sorry? It is something else. Uh, oh, now I'm back here. Uh, I know for sure it's bang, uh, so 2041. Uh, but history is supposed to do that too. Uh, sorry, not 2041, uh, 2034 now. Uh, so exclamation mark number will repeat the command. That's funny, the, okay. I'll have to look into why that's not behaving the way I think it. History n, according to the bash manual, history followed by the line number is supposed to repeat that line number. Okay. Uh, so you can go back and redo a command, which is uh, super useful. It's really useful if you have to type in some long, obscure command that you don't remember, uh, that you don't memorize, uh, and then you have to go back and do that later, right? So for example, when I generate the web page for an assignment, I have to type in some long, obscure command that I never remember the exact format of. It's no problem, I just type in history and there it is, right? I can go back and find it, it's no problem. Okay, tab completion. Tab completion is another super useful thing when you're working on the command line. Okay, so uh, bash, oh, sorry, question, yeah? No, it'll repeat the command in the current working directory. Okay. Yeah, so it just repeats the command. Uh, right, when you're working on the command line, uh, basically you're typing, right? So. Programmers being lazy, right, like to, make, like to make shortcuts. So bash has a shortcut in it. It will try to auto-complete command names for you, right? So for example, if I type in CL and then press the tab key, so I'm gonna press tab, right? Bash knows that there's only one command that starts with the word, word, uh, letter CL, right? That happens to be the clear command. Uh, the clear command clears the console, uh, clears the terminal, right? If I just type in C and then press tab, nothing happens, right? Not surprisingly, because there's probably a lot of commands that begin with C. But if you press it again, right, it now says, do you want to see all of the commands that begin with C, yes or no? Right, if I press yes, it prints them all out. Right, so uh, we can just pick one here, I don't know. Uh, anything interesting? Curl, I guess. Uh, so if I type in cu r and then tab, it'll auto-complete the curl. Right, so the autocomplete feature is handy. Uh, it gets handier than that. It's not so handy for entering commands. My, oh, there we go. Right, uh, so it's more useful, the autocomplete feature is more useful for autocompleting file names, right? So for example, if I want to CD to some, if I want to change directories to some other directory, right? If I type in CD and then root U, and then press the tab key, right? So cd slash u tab, it auto completes the usr, right? Because there's only one directory uh, name that starts with a u inside uh, the root directory, right? If I type in l, it does nothing, but if I press it twice, it lists out all of the directories uh, that begin with uh, the letter l, right? So if I do lo and then tab, it auto completes, right? This saves you a ton of typing if you work on the command line a lot, right? Especially when complete, uh, completing command, uh, file names, right? So remember that, it's super useful, right? The tab completion. All right, lists of commands. So, uh, so far all we've seen is commands, options, arguments, right? Can you string multiple commands together? We've seen that you can use a pipe to do that, right? We'll talk more about pipes later on. Uh, but you can do other things with commands as well, right? So you can do what's called a list of commands. So a list of commands is a sequence of one or more commands separated by one of these four things, right? So you can have a command with its options and arguments followed by a semicolon, right? Or you can have a command followed by its options and arguments followed by an ampersand, right? Or two ampersands or two vertical bars, okay? So the semicolon is, uh, is basically a command separator, right? So it does the same, sort of the same thing as the semicolon in Java, right? Ends a statement, right? 
semicolon in bash will uh, end the command, right? The separate commands. So if you want to type in several commands on the same line, you just type in the commands on the same line separated with the semicolon. Uh, when you, uh, oh, that's interesting. Okay, so when you type in a bunch of commands separated by semicolons, it just runs the commands in the order that you type them in. Okay. Uh, so the shell runs the first command, waits for it to finish, runs the second command, waits for it to finish, runs the third command, waits for it to finish. Do I tell you what and is? I just want to quickly check if I, okay, so it comes, comes next. Uh, and, so double and, or double ampersand, and double vertical bar, right? So these look like the and and or operators in Java, or C, right? Uh, these are kind of useful. So, uh, oh, okay, we're talking about that later. There's the ampersand, here we go. Okay, so command one, double ampersand command two, right? That will run command two if and only if command one actually succeeds, right? So if command one doesn't fail for some reason or does not encounter an error, then command two runs. Whoa, sorry, then command two runs, right? If command one does encounter an error of some kind, command two does not run. Right? So this is often useful. So for example, if I write that, right? So cd space tilde, right? Remember tilde is your home directory, right? So that should switch to your home directory your home directory almost certainly exists, so that should always work, right? So that'll switch to the home directory, it will succeed, and then it'll list the contents of your home directory, right? So I can run that, not surprisingly it works, right? Now, if you type in, uh, if you type in CD and then some directory that doesn't exist, right? Or you don't know if it exists, and then write and and ls, Right? That will try to switch to that directory. If it succeeds, it'll print out the contents of the directory. If it fails, it will not run the ls command. Right? So there is no directory called dir name in this directory, so if I run that, right, you get the error from cd, which you should, because right, that directory doesn't exist, but it does not try to run the ls command. Right? So this is occasionally useful when you run a command uh, and then you want to run a second command depending on whether or not the first command works. Or is similar. So or, right, so command one, double bar, command two, runs command two if and only if command one encounters some kind of error, right? So if command one fails for some reason, right, then command two runs. If command one is successful, command two does not run, right? So for example, if I try to change directories to that directory and it doesn't exist, right? so it doesn't exist, so CD will fail, right? When CD fails, right, I know that directory doesn't exist, so I'm gonna make that directory, right, semicolon, then I'm gonna change that directory, semicolon, then I'm gonna print the, that directory name, right? So I know there is no directory called dir name in this directory if I run that command, right? It says, hey, there is no directory called dir name, which it should, right? But then it's gonna go ahead and make that directory, switch to that directory and print it out, right? Uh, so there's an example of using the double bar, right? To do something when some other command fails. All right, what else do we have here? And uh, I guess I skipped over this. That's a sequence of commands, right? So multiple commands on the same line separated by semicolons. Right, switch to the home directory, print the directory name of the home directory, list the contents of the home directory, right? Instead of writing it out on three lines, you can write it on one line as long as you separate it with colons, uh, semicolons. Okay, the single ampersand, right? So I told you there's four things that make up a list of commands. Uh, that one ends a command. Uh, the ampersand also ends a command. Uh, the ampersand's a bit strange. Oh, question, sorry. Yeah, can you use multiple double ampersands and double bars? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, single ampersand. Okay, so the single ampersand, we're not gonna see a lot in this course, and you won't encounter it um, very much. Um, so the single ampersand is used when you run a command that might take a long time to finish, and you don't want your terminal to be just sitting there waiting for the command to finish, 
right? So you want to run a command. It's going to take a while to do whatever it is you need to do, but you still want to be able to enter in more commands, right? Usually this happens when you start up some sort of interactive program from the command prompt, right? So for example, I can start Eclipse from the command prompt, right? So let's just do this. Uh, let me show you this as an example. Okay, so Eclipse is installed if you have the virtual machine, right? So if you type in Eclipse, right? Now if I just type in Eclipse and press enter, probably shouldn't do this because it's going to take forever to run. It's going to take a long time to start up because it's starting up on a virtual machine and uh, anyway. Uh, but you can see, as it's waiting to start up, if I type something into the shell, it doesn't respond to what I'm typing in, right? And the reason it's not responding to what I'm typing in is because when I type in a long-lived command, I don't get control of the shell back until the command finishes. So in this case, I'm not going to get control of this shell back until Eclipse is closed, right? So here it is, launch, right? Notice I still don't have control of the terminal, right? If I wanted control of the terminal, then the way to uh, run the Eclipse command is to put an ampersand after Eclipse. Uh, I'm just going to wait for this to start and then I'm going to close it again so that I can get my shell back. Sorry, I shouldn't have done uh, this particular example because <laughs> it's very slow. Uh, Eclipse is installed, by the way, so that uh, if you want an IDE for C, uh, you have a fully functioning IDE for C. Uh, Eclipse is nice because it has a debugger. The debugger in C, uh, the debugger in Eclipse is way better than the command line debugger um, that you would have to use otherwise. Unfortunately, it takes forever to start. So maybe I can kill it. Can I? Yes, I can. Okay. So if I had typed in Eclipse and, uh, Eclipse and right, that's going to start up Eclipse, but it's going to run Eclipse in what's called the background. So it's going to start up Eclipse, it's going to create a new shell, it's going to run Eclipse in that new shell, and then it's going to give me back this shell, right? So notice that I can now type in stuff here, and it responds, right? So the ampersand ends the command, runs that command in the background. Normally, you only want to do this with long-lived commands, like Eclipse, right, for example. Uh, and now I'm stuck with Eclipse starting up, so let's see what happens. Okay, uh, so that's the basics of using commands um, in a lecture. I guess this is a good place to stop. Oh, there's a clip. Uh, anybody have any questions about uh, today's lecture? Yes. Uh, what's the difference between uh, LS and DIR? DIR. DIR. So. <coughs> Sorry, I just need my, there we go. So DIR also lists the contents of a directory. It's probably alias to ls, actually. Probably the same command. Yeah. Anything else? All right, that's it for today. Come on. Hi. Here. Well, yeah, probably here. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. So 